This is Linda Carty. She's a British grandmother about to be put to death in Texas. In 2001, she was accused of stealing a four-day-old baby and killing his mother. It's a charge she's always denied. I don't want anybody's baby that bad to take anybody's baby. It's the bottom line. Her accent's American, but Linda was born on the Commonwealth Island of St. Kitts and is a British citizen. If she's killed, she'll be the first British woman to be executed for over 50 years. You know, what that says to me is it's one vast step for humankind backwards. I'm Steve Humphreys. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I've been trying to find out more about Linda, who she is, what she did, and how she ended up in the worst place in the world. The date of her execution could be announced at any time. Then, she'll have just 90 days to live. My fears are basically that they'll win and that my mom won't come home. And I'll have nothing. No mom. The clock is ticking. And now, only pressure from the British people can help save Linda's life. This is the extraordinary story of the British woman on death row. During 2009, as part of a major arts project, the fourth plinth in London's Trafalgar Square was opened up to the public. Anyone was invited to apply to stand on the plinth for an hour to do or say whatever they wanted. And over the course of 100 days, 2,400 people did just that. But among the jugglers and fire eaters, there was one personal appeal that caught my eye. Hello, Trafalgar Square. My name is Linda Carty, and I'm speaking to you from death row in Texas, in the United States. During it his is hour everybody's work, artist worst Brian nightmare to be executed for a crime they did not plea from commit. Linda Carty to the people of Britain. I'm sorry if I sound like a desperate woman. I am desperate. Because the British people may be my last hope. If they ask for my life to be spared, maybe Texas will listen. Please listen and tell everyone you know. Please don't let me die here. I was intrigued, so went to see Clive Stafford-Smith, director of the human rights charity Reprieve, who was trying to save her life. In 1987, Clive came to the public's attention when he featured in a groundbreaking documentary called 14 Days in May, which followed his failed attempt to save a man from the gas chamber in Mississippi. Many of the guards on death row were sure that Edward Johnson was innocent, but that didn't prevent his execution. Clive was devastated and gave this impassioned speech to the waiting media. Everyone's been very calm and collected about this. Well, let me tell you, I'm not calm and I'm not collected. I had a privilege to stay with Edward Johnson for the last hours of his life. And I can say he was a lot more calm than I was. And I can only say this, when the family asked me why, all I could say was, it's a sick world. It's a sick world. Thank you. Since then, Clive has represented over 300 people facing the death penalty and has won nearly every case. I don't really get into these debates about what's wrong with the death penalty because the profound issue to me is what's right with it. You know, what does the death penalty achieve? And you know, when I watch people die in front of me, and I come out of that place and I think, well, you know, is the world suddenly a better place? No, it's not. It's, it's disgusting. And you cannot imagine the history books writing that this was a civilized, sensible way to run society any more than they say that burning witches at the stake was a wonderful idea. Clive was hoping that reprieve could help save Linda's life, but it seemed that her chances were slim. Sometimes I think of these capital cases as a game of hangman. You remember the game where you have to get the word right and every time you get the wrong letter you put another bit of the gallows in until you hang the person. Um, 
And if it is a game of hangman, then by the time you get to this stage, when you're convicted and you're on death row, you're 95% dead. It's very hard to prevent an execution in America today. But from what I knew of Clyde, as long as there was the possibility of a last minute reprieve, he never gave up the fight. After our meeting, I decided to get as involved as I could. I found some news footage in the archives, read the court papers, and from the police in Houston were sent over a hundred crime scene photos, some of which were quite horrific. They also sent me over four hours worth of incredible interview material, which they'd recorded just hours after Linda was brought in for questioning. It's a complicated story, but this is what I pieced together. In the early hours of the 16th of May 2001, a criminal gang broke into the home of a young Mexican family who lived two doors away from Linda. They ransacked the property, bound and beat the husband, then snatched his wife and newborn baby from their bed before driving off into the night. The abduction made headline news. A chain lock meant for protection lies in a heap of broken wood by the Rodriguez apartment front door. Luis Rodriguez says his cousin Raimundo Cabrera and another cousin were beaten by five masked and armed men as they broke in and demanded money. Moments after that, the armed men kidnapped Cabrera's wife, 20-year-old Joanna, and the couple's four-day-old baby boy, Ray. Police are calling this an abduction, but at this time do not have a good description on any of the suspects, and that's because at least three of the men were wearing masks. Authorities also do not consider this a drug deal gone bad, but they are very concerned at this hour about the well-being of that newborn baby. Anyone with any information about this case is asked to call authorities immediately. As police searched the area, a $5,000 reward was offered by Crime Stoppers. A neighbor who didn't want to be identified on the news contacted the police. She claimed that Linda had told her she was going to have a baby, but she didn't look pregnant. Then just straight out of the blues, she said, I'm going to be having the baby tomorrow. She used her two hands and patted her stomach. Linda was called in for questioning. She said she didn't know anything about the kidnapping, but then told an unconvincing story about how she'd lent her cars to a man called Oscar and that he and his friend Chris might have been involved. OK, who is Oscar? Is he black American or what? Yeah. Where does he live? Who is this asshole? Give it up. Tell me so we can get this shit on behind us. Who is it? Yeah, yeah but then I'm going to get charged for something I don't have any. Linda, do what's right. Hours later, on the other side of town, the police made a breakthrough. In this yard, they found Linda's cars. In the back seat of one of them, they found baby Ray. He was unharmed. But in the boot of the other, they found the body of his mother, Joanna Rodriguez. She had been bound and suffocated. The man called Oscar has never been identified, but the other, Chris Robinson, was picked up at the scene. This will be an interview uh, with an individual by the name of Chris Anthony Robinson. He was a black male, 32, date of birth of 12, 13, 69. Robinson admitted being one of the masked men who'd abducted the baby, but said that Linda was responsible for the subsequent death of his mother. Well, you know, she was trying to kill the lady. She was trying to suffocate the lady. How do you know that? Because she had a bag on her head and the bag was stuck to her face. Okay. And I tried to, you know what I'm saying, had a, a bag off of, you know what I'm saying, before she can get some air. Okay. And then she, she just kept on pursuing him, trying to kill her. She said, talking about how she going to kill her and burn her up and burn her body. And man, that's some gross, pretty cruel shit. Man. Further evidence was uncovered, including a baby seat, a pushchair, and baby clothes found in Linda's car. And mobile phone records showed that Linda's phone had been used to call the gang at the time of the crime. The police were convinced they'd got their woman. I think you wanted a baby pretty bad. Oh, um, you trying to tell me that you think I paid them to do this? You trying to tell me that? That I set it up? Is that what you're saying? 
I think you want a baby pretty bad. Mr. Scales, I don't want anybody's baby that badly to take anybody's baby. It's the bottom line. I didn't have to take. How many people around the area have babies? Huh? I'm going to talk to my partner, man, okay? I didn't take anybody's you want baby. You drink or something? No, I don't. Oh. Oh. Linda was charged with capital murder. Within a year, she'd been sentenced to death. The evidence that she'd been involved seemed to be overwhelming. What kind of woman could commit a crime like this? I came to Texas to find out. I'd arranged to meet Linda on death row, but first I spoke to her attorney, and he had a very different view of the case. When I took this case on, I was pro-death penalty. And I look at this case, and I know, without a shadow of a doubt, with every core of my being, that it is outrageous that she could be put to death under these circumstances. This case was obviously more complex than I'd imagined. And the only way to find out more would be to meet Linda Carty in person on death row. This is the Mountain View unit, Gatesville in Texas, currently home to 10 women on death row. Among them is British grandmother, Linda Carty. I'd come here to find out who she was, where she'd come from, and how she'd ended up here awaiting execution. But I didn't know how much I'd find out in the short time the authorities had given me. Here on death row, as you know, they've got quite strict rules and we only got one hour to do this. And um, the seconds are ticking away now. So tell me a bit about what life is like on death row. It's hell. It's hell. The officers here, there are some of them who make it hell. And they make it hell for you because it is a, this is a petty, this is the pettiest place I've ever been, I've been around people who, it's like, they hate you for being different. Linda is here because she was found guilty of masterminding the kidnapping of a baby, during which the baby's mother was killed. She has always denied any involvement in the crime. How shocking it was to hear the cop, you know, um, ask me where I was and then tried to tell me that he think that I had something to do with it. And it was like, you have the wrong person. I know nothing about this murder. I don't know anything about um, an abduction. I don't even know the victim who you're talking about. I've never met that lady before. And then um, it was like, it was a nightmare. Linda then began to tell me the same complicated story she'd originally told the police about how she'd only become implicated because her cars had been taken and were later found at the crime scene. I wasn't convinced by her account, but Clive Stafford Smith, who's been campaigning to save her life, thinks he has an explanation. I personally think she's innocent, wholly innocent, and this is your problem when you're dealing with someone in Linda's situation is that an innocent person is totally useless. They can't tell you anything because they weren't there. They didn't do it. They can speculate, but I can speculate. Uh, and so representing an innocent person is actually extremely difficult. And it's very, very hard to prove that someone's innocent because you're not going to do that unless you prove who's guilty and why. But if there's the slightest possibility that Linda's innocent, why is she on death row today? Defense attorney Michael Goldberg has been representing Linda for the past seven years. He told me he's been so incensed by the inadequacies of her original defense lawyer, he's been working on her case for free. Well, in the beginning, I, when I took the case on, I had no idea what I was getting into or, or what was really there. Once we got into the case and I saw what had happened to her in the trial, 
or really what didn't happen in terms of no defense, uh, I just became outraged. So what sort of defense did Linda get? Meet Jerry Garino, the lawyer who promotes himself as the go-to defender in Houston. Hi, my name is Jerry Garino. I'm a licensed attorney in the state of Texas and in federal court. I've been practicing law for 38 years. I've tried criminal cases all the way from simple misdemeanors to capital murder cases. I'd like to be your attorney and I'm willing to work with you. Such was Jerry Garino's reputation for losing capital cases. He'd been dubbed the undertaker for the state of Texas. The people who get the death penalty don't get it for the worst crime. They get it for having the worst lawyer. And that's so true of Jerry Guerrino. I don't think it can plausibly be said that there's a worse capital defense lawyer in America. This is a guy who has represented way fewer people than I have. I've represented phew, almost 10 times as many people facing the death penalty as he has. And yet he's got 20 people he sent to death row. You know, he's got more clients who have been on death row than 26 of the United States have on their entire death row. Um, and it's pretty obvious as to why he does. He just does a terrible job. I tried to talk to Jerry Garina to find out his version of events, but he wouldn't return my calls. And I got a similar response from the judge and the prosecution. There seemed to be a strange wall of silence surrounding Linda's trial, and I wondered why. So what did Garino do wrong? Allegedly, the first thing was that he hardly spent any time with Linda before her trial. I average thousands of hours on any case that goes to a capital trial. What Jerry Guerino did was quintessentially what you shouldn't do in a capital case. He never, ever made an effort to achieve a relationship with his client. You cannot look a juror in the eye and convince them not to kill an individual if you haven't reached some sort of emotional level of friendship with that person. According to Linda, Guerino spent just 15 minutes with her before they went to court. Yet did that really matter? Because from what I knew of the case, the evidence that she'd been involved seemed to be overwhelming. But was that evidence sound? It was the prosecution's theory that Linda was worried that her common law husband was going to leave her so she thought if she had a baby, he would stay. They allege that she was unable to get pregnant, so hired three criminals to steal a baby for her. One of those criminals was Chris Robinson. Well, you know you're in pretty deep shit, don't you? Yes, sir. I, I couldn't take it back, sir. No, you can't. The girl's dead. No, it's... Did you kill that girl? No, sir. Do you have any part in killing that girl? No, sir. I want to let the girl go. I want to let her go with her baby. And why didn't you? Because, you know, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't have shot call her. I couldn't call her shot to say let her go and you know what I'm saying? Why you couldn't you call a shot your man? I knew it, but I wasn't the only man. Did you describe Linda to me? A wicked. Wicked, wicked, wicked lady. Robinson and the other two criminals admitted their part in the abduction, but claimed that Linda had set them up. But Michael Goldberg told me that their evidence was unreliable because they'd struck a deal with the prosecution. Although they'd originally been charged with capital murder, they had their sentences reduced in return for blaming Linda. If you throw out the criminal's testimony used to save their own lives, what does the state have? The state has nothing. And so it just makes this case, you're relying on criminals to impose the death penalty on someone when you don't give it to the people that admitted they did the crime. And what greater motive do these criminals have to testify against Linda except to avoid the death penalty? The men who were convicted of the murder just got a prison sentence exactly. and you were sentenced to death. Exactly. The one who had nothing to do with this crime is the one who's sitting on death row today. But it was Robinson who placed Linda at the crime scene and gave the most damning testimony against her. He claimed she told them that her neighbor's house was a drugs den 
and that if they broke in, they'd find cash and marijuana, which they could keep. He said Linda told him she just wanted the pregnant lady inside and that she was going to cut the baby out of her. Scissors found in Linda's bag were provided as evidence of her intentions. It was enough to convince jurors like Tommy Cabana. She's pure evil. You know, Linda Cardi is the most evil person right behind uh, uh, Saddam Hussein or bin Laden. She's, in my view, if you're willing to kill somebody or their child, you're no different than they are. But as Clive Stafford Smith pointed out to me, getting jurors like Tommy fired up with some gruesome evidence was all part of the prosecution's strategy. However, he claims there was an obvious flaw with that evidence. And there were indeed a set of scissors that the prosecution said were the ones that Linda had got to cut this child out. But Jerry Guerino apparently didn't even look at them. If he had, he would have seen the scissors, and they were scissors with rounded ends. They were bandage scissors that could no more cut a child out of anything than, than your fingers could. The deeper you delve into this case, the more you discover that maybe not everything is what it seems. Like the baby things found at the scene. Linda doesn't deny that they were hers, but claims she bought them because she'd been pregnant and then had one of many miscarriages. It's a story that her daughter Javel confirms. And as for the phone records, Linda says her phone was left in one of the cars that the gang took, so they must have used it. On many of the key issues, there are plausible explanations that Jerry Guerino could have made more of in court. Yet just because she'd had a bad lawyer doesn't mean to say she's innocent. The problem was, it was so difficult to work out what had actually happened on the night of the murder. Like, how did Joanna Rodriguez die? Did Linda kill her, like Chris Robinson said? Or did Robinson, or one of the other gang members, do it? Maybe nobody meant to kill her, but she suffocated because she'd been left bound and gagged. There were so many unanswered questions that I still didn't know what to make of Linda. But you'd think that before executing someone, you'd have to be completely certain that they were guilty. And her trial had been so bungled by her lawyer, it was impossible to tell. In any event, you'd think that a decent lawyer would have made sure that there were no mitigating factors, because in Texas, if the court hears evidence of good character or a troubled background, the penalty is likely to be life imprisonment rather than the death sentence. To look for mitigating factors in Linda's case, Jerry Guerino should have gone to St. Kitts, but although the court offered him money to do just that, he never went. So we did. Because if you want to know who she really is, you have to uncover the extraordinary life story that led her to death row. This is the village of Old Road on the Caribbean island of St. Kitts, the place where Linda Carty was born. I wanted to come here to delve deeper into Linda's life story. I wanted to know more about who she was and whether there were any mitigating factors that might have changed the outcome of her trial. Linda's lawyer should have made this journey, but although the court offered him money to come, he didn't bother. So what would he have found here? Linda was born into a large and well-to-do family in 1958 and grew up in this house. It would be another 25 years before St. Kitts gained her independence from Britain. But I'm told that Linda's family were patriotic, and Linda once sang for Prince Charles during a royal visit. She was a bright girl and went to one of the best schools on the island, where as well as academic classes, the pupils were given a thorough grounding in the basic principles of right and wrong. The main principle of the school was teaching you to be good citizens through honesty, respect, 
trustworthiness, all the characters which make you, what you call then the fruits of the Spirit is goodness, kindness, being loving, being caring for one another. Those are the things we learned at, um, we learned at Epworth. solid academic background, Linda was brought up in the church. Religion still plays an important part of life for many on the island today. You know, the entire family was religious, has a religious background, and she had a, a religious foundation. It's unfortunate that I cannot really call her but if I can speak to my sister at this time, I would tell her, keep hope alive. Continue to pray as your family and friends are praying for you. Just keep hope alive. One of Linda's greatest joys had been to sing in church with her family and today the old songs help keep up her spirits. She sang one for me, and given her current circumstances, her choice was perhaps profound. Um, I will sing something that a lot of people are familiar with, and it's one of the songs that I love. Um, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. That's the song, one of the songs that I kind of revert back to whenever I get depressed in here and the whole legal process gets heavy, you know, it, it gets unbearable. I go back to that song. By the 1970s, Linda Carty had become a well-loved primary school teacher who devoted her time to her pupils and often gave extra lessons to children with special needs. But all that was to come to a crashing end when she became pregnant after a relationship with a policeman. And in St Kitts at that time, the stigma of illegitimacy could have far-reaching consequences. At that point in time, once you got pregnant as a non-married person, you lost your job. So um, that was her situation. It was a huge embarrassment for her. Not only was it embarrassing for her, it was very painful at the time because the father of the child distanced himself. And of course, that would have had to have been hard. And it's not something that her family was happy about, so of course, she had trouble at home, she had trouble at, while they supported her, um, whether financially or otherwise, the emotional support was not there. This is something she really struggled with. Despite the stigma, Linda was determined to keep the baby and to be a good mother. And in September 1979, she gave birth to her daughter, Javelle. Having that baby, smelling that baby, and seeing that baby just absorbed in you, you know, and knowing that she's dependent on you, and she knows that you're her mom, and it's like you're her world, you know. It, it's a feeling that I can't, it's indescribable, but yet, if you're a parent, you'll understand. The first time you look at that baby, and you say, wow, I made that baby, you know, I made this child. Linda decided to make a new life for herself and Javel away from St Kitts, 
and in 1982 they came to Texas in search of the American dream. They settled in Houston, and a year later, the rest of the family came to join them, reunited once more after their problems back home. And it seems that for a while, things went well. I was very proud of my mom growing up. I thought my mom was the greatest person in the world. She's always nice to me. She was always loving. She's always there whenever I needed anything or anyone. She was there to talk to you. She was the greatest. But it wasn't enough for Linda. She wanted to build on her academic qualifications, and with the support of her family, she enrolled on a pharmacy course at Houston University. The American dream was within Linda's grasp. But then, one night after her studies, she was walking through a car park to find her car and was approached by two men. First, they asked her for money. Then, they raped her. It traumatized me then, in that I was so scared to go back to school. I was scared to get on the free. I was scared to drive. I was scared to go back to school. I had to drop out of um, college then. And if that wasn't enough, as a result of the rape, Linda became pregnant. Javel was only a child, but she has a clear memory of the effect it had on her mother. I could tell that there was a change in my mom because she wasn't as happy as she usually is. She's kind of sad a lot. And a nap later, I can look back and see that she was a little depressed at that time. And now I can look back and even see that that was around the time that she had started to gain weight. So now I can look back and piece it all together. It was more or less like a nosedive into depression and all those months, because you know, you're Catholic and you just don't have abortions. So that wasn't an option. And I took the baby to full term and then searched for some adoption, aid, adoption agencies because I knew that I wouldn't be a good mother to that child. I found out that Linda gave her baby up for adoption. But even though she was suffering from depression, she didn't tell her family what had happened, fearing a repeat of the rejection she'd experienced on some kids. As a single mom, and you should know that if you're single, it's like, okay, I had a, the first baby I had out of wedlock, I'm not married, and then to have another child and to have somebody, it was like a, a, a taboo. You know, in our society, you just don't do something like that. So I didn't want to disrespect my mom and I didn't want to have my mother's um, anger or hatred or anything. So I just decided to give the baby up. It was difficult explaining to someone that somebody raped you. And then to have a baby and you don't even know who the father is. After that traumatic experience, Linda entered into a number of difficult and abusive relationships. One boyfriend regularly beat her. The next was a wanted man. I got into this relationship with this guy and found out that I was pregnant too, and I found out that he is a drug dealer and that he is wanted not only by the DEA, which is the Drug Enforcement Agency in Houston, but he was wanted by the FBI. And it was like, oh my goodness. I went from bad to worse. Linda stayed with him, but was secretly contacted by the DEA, who pressured her into becoming a confidential informant. Our research confirms that she was soon working undercover, infiltrating drugs gangs on behalf of the government and regularly risking her life. I dealt with the roughest of rough. I dealt with the worst criminals. It wasn't your Sunday school kids that I dealt with. These were hardcore criminals who will cut your throat in a heartbeat or they will come to your house if something goes wrong and they found out that you were on the tape for. It's on the record that her old boss at the DEA 
later said he would willingly have testified on her behalf if only her lawyer had asked him. But he never did. I wanted to know more, but my hour with Linda was drawing to an end. I still didn't know whether she was guilty or not, but after what I'd heard, it didn't seem to matter. Her life story had been so tragic and the mitigating factors so strong, I was convinced that this woman deserved our sympathy. How could anyone not be moved by the sorry sequence of events that led her to death row? So what does the future hold now for Linda Carty and her family? And what can be done to save her life? British grandmother Linda Carty has been on death row in Texas since 2002, and her time is running out. So far, all the appeals her new lawyers have submitted have been rejected. The order for her execution could be granted any day, and once that happens, Linda will have just 90 days to live. It's like she's dying in slow motion. But does Linda Carty deserve to die? Because from what I've discovered, there are many reasons why she shouldn't. With most death row inmates being poor or black, it seems that in Texas, the chances of winning a capital case can still rest on the color of your skin and your ability to hire the most expensive lawyers. I went to see Texan anti-death penalty campaigner, Professor David Dow. The Linda Carty case, in many ways, could be a case study of everything that's wrong with the death penalty in the US and the death penalty in Texas in particular. What do I mean by that? Add together lawyers at her trial who were not of the quality of privately retained lawyers, a poor defendant who was entirely dependent on the state to provide her with resources, this racial dimension to the case where you have a black defendant and white uh, victims, and then the failure of those lawyers to go gather all of the relevant evidence about her background and present it to the jury so that the jury could make what's called a reasoned moral judgment about the case. And what you have in the Linda Cardi case, I believe, is a case where virtually every systemic failure of the death penalty system in Texas is present. Linda Carty may well be the unluckiest woman on death row. Not only has she had a difficult life, and arguably the worst capital defense lawyer in Texas, but as a British citizen, she should also have been given the full support of the British government. If only her lawyer had told the British authorities, as he was required to do under international law. It's a terrible failure of the system, uh, and, uh, and all I can say is that I know we've spoken to the authorities here, Harris County authorities, that they have changed the system uh, so that won't happen again. But that's too late for Linda Carty. Uh, it's, in my view, it made a, a material difference to the outcome of this case. So why does the state of Texas insist on killing her? Is it to satisfy the retributive impulses of the family of the victim? When I see my baby, I see my wife. I see his, his eyes, I can see my wife. I've always been aware that there are other victims in this case. Joanna Rodriguez was buried in her homeland of Mexico, and I found out that her husband, Raimundo Cabrera, has since moved there to look after baby Ray with the rest of his family. I want to take care of, take care of baby Ray. I'm going to take care of him real good. At the time of the trial, Raimundo Cabrera sought retribution for the murder of his wife. But now, over 10 years after the crime, I wondered if Linda's death would really bring him satisfaction. More than half the time, the victim's family decides they don't want the death penalty because it's all a big lie, isn't it? I mean, people tell them at the beginning that somehow uh, that you're going to get a catharsis out of this person getting killed. And gradually it becomes clear to the victims that actually killing this other person is not going to bring my loved one back. 
Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just bring this situation. Having met right some of those closest to Linda, it occurred to me that if only the two grieving families could find a way to come together, there might be reconciliation, not retribution. Amen. Even during this time of pain, certainly my family and I. heart still goes out to the loss of the other family's life because not having my sister is almost like even though my sister is not dead like you feel like you've suffered this grief yourself but I'm hoping and I'm praying and I miss her Another reason why the state wants to execute Linda is that the court decided that she remains a future danger to society. But does society need protecting from Linda Carty? Is she really a dangerous woman? Because the Linda I met just wants to go home to see the grandchildren that the authorities won't allow on death row. Jory and Kate, I love them. I love them so much. I can't hear their voices, I can't see their smiles. And that in itself is like a death. It's because of people like Linda that Clive Stafford Smith will never give up the fight. In her case, all he wants is for the British people to get involved, and just like that artist on the plinth, to help save her life. There's almost no limit to what people can do to help someone in Linda's situation, and you know what you have to remember is a lot of this is about power, it's about generating support for Linda. And my main frustration is probably with the number of people who stand back and do nothing. And a number of millions of people who know this is wrong but don't do something to stop it. That's the reason we get in these pickles. When Clive made the documentary 14 Days in May, Edward Johnson, the man who was executed in Mississippi, was able to spend his last moments with his family. But today in Texas, these tender moments are not allowed. And unless there is a last minute reprieve, Linda and her daughter Javel will never get to hold one another again. My fears are basically that that they'll win. That they'll win and that my mom won't come home. Those are my fears. And that this will be it. That'll be the end. And I'll have nothing. I have no mom. Having investigated the Linda Carty case, I found that she'd been shamed, beaten, and raped. She should not now be executed. Her trial was a fiasco. It was fundamentally flawed, and the degree to which she was involved in the crime is almost impossible to know. But even if she had been involved, what kind of mother would kill for another woman's child? Surely, only one in need of serious psychiatric help, not the death sentence. So how can we, as human beings, allow a woman like Linda to be executed? In Texas, Linda's mother Enid celebrated her 75th birthday. Linda knows she might not see her again. Dear Mommy, happy birthday. I so wish I could be there in Houston to share this special day with you. I hope we'll be together again alive soon. I love you very much, Mom. Much love from Linda. Today, Linda's not afraid of death. 
but of the effect her execution would have on the loved ones she'll leave behind. If I have to die, I pray that my family and my mom, especially my daughter, will not look and not feel ashamed of their daughter or their mother. It isn't because your mother or your daughter or your sister is guilty. It is because the state of Texas has failed me and failed me badly. So I just want you to know that I will, you can always love me and love, you know, treasure the memories that you have of me. But fight, fight to clear my name. My time with Linda Carty and her family had come to an end. And as I made the journey home from death row, the words from Linda's song stayed with me. Amazing grace. Reprieve How tells me that Linda's last hope rests with the British public. The if you want to help, now is the time to act. Oh, but now I see.